members that we have topical questions which will last up to 15 minutes and then we'll move to questions that appear in the order paper. Could I remind members that it's one inquiry, whether it be topical questions or oral questions later on. Also to remind ministers of the two minute rule and I can understand on occasions because of the nature of the question on the order paper ministers will want more time and it's a matter of ministers indicating to the House that they need more time because of the nature of the question. If that is clear, we shall proceed. And I call Mr. Alistair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the First Minister give an assurance, particularly to innocent victims who were greatly relieved by his U turn on the implementation of the Maze project, that that stance will not be traded or diluted either in the Haas talks or anywhere else? Mr. Speaker, I seem to recall the member on a previous occasion having indicated that uh, the Democratic Unionist Party had already traded this issue and that was why they were taking the position that they had. Now that we have clearly shown that that is not the case, can I make it very clear to them that I wouldn't characterise the position I have adopted as being a U-turn. The Ulster Unionist Party placed the Peace Centre in the maze complex. Uh, I have indicated that it would be unwise uh, for Northern Ireland to proceed with a peace centre which itself was going to be a cause of division uh, and that there is a necessity uh, to have a broad base of cross-community support for any such uh, project. That remains my position. Mr. Alistair. The First Minister must be one of the few people who doesn't see it as a U-turn. I don't think there's any shame in that. Doing the right thing is never something to be ashamed of. But could the First Minister shed any light if the $18 million which was previously to be squandered on the maze, is not now there to be squandered there. What is the thinking about where that money might be more beneficially and usefully used? Well, Mr. Speaker, of course uh, it will be a matter for the SEUPB to, to look at what projects can use any money that might be available. And I do understand that uh, he, he does have some sympathy for, for U-turns because uh, this is the same member who comes in here week after week and the man from Mars would think that he was breathing fire on Republicans and he chides me for doing business with Republicans but then secretly and outside of this house oh. the member as the executor of a will is selling land to Republicans in County Fermanagh to benefit his own family so it ill becomes him, it ill becomes him to order this house, order, beating order, his chest as if he's scorned order, to order, be order, 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 Republicans. Order, 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 the map, order, 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 the member must take a seat, order, order. Order, 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 order. I must ask the member to take a seat. Order, order, order. Roy Banks, Mr. Banks. Uh, the, uh, about a year ago, the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister announced the establishment of 10 social enterprise hubs. And about a year ago, uh, social enterprise NI was established. Can the First Minister indicate to us? What conversations and discussions he has had with enterprise, social enterprise in Northern Ireland? Well, I personally haven't had any. Uh, obviously, as soon as we produce proposals that uh, have various aspects of overarching responsibility, it then becomes a, a matter for the minister and department who has the, the job of taking the project forward to deal directly with its uh, implementation. Uh, so it's probably a question that could more directly be uh, asked to the, the minister responsible. Right. The minister agree that social enterprise in Northern Ireland are the experts in this area with knowledge of social enterprises elsewhere within the United Kingdom and elsewhere, and why have they not been consulted to date? Well, this of course is a matter for DSD, and this is one of the difficulties we get with the topical questions. DSD, as I understand it, have already identified the locations for these uh, and will be bringing them, them forward. Uh, if the member wants to have more information, it's the DSD minister that he needs to be asking the questions to. Raymond McCarthy, Mr. McCarthy. 
Cooler, uh, can I ask the First Minister uh, to provide a, a recent update on the appointments of the Alex Board in Derry, please? Mr. Uh, Speaker, in terms of uh, ILEX, there have been some controversial uh, issues in relation to the, the Board. Uh, and of course, it is important from the point of view of uh, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister that uh, this important uh, body does move forward. Uh, the, uh, a new chair and three new board members uh, were appointed to ILEX uh, back on the 16th of this month, uh, and they have been appointed, as I understand it, for a three-year term. Uh, the, uh, Philip Flynn was appointed chair. Jerry Mullen, Henry McGarvey and Aaron McElhinney were appointed non-executive -direct directors. Uh, prior to their appointment, all appointees indicated that they had not undertaken any uh, party political uh, activity within the, within the last five years. A competition to re uh, recruit a chair of the ILEX board was undertaken in 2012. This competition did not provide a wide enough pool of candidates, therefore a further competition commenced uh, earlier this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Indeed, I congratulate the new appointments to bring the necessary leadership to Alex. Now, given them recent appointments and the need for them, uh, has the uh, Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister any indicative time frame for the appointment of the, a much needed Chief Executive? Well, I think it's wrong for us to get into the, the business of giving precise dates. Uh, I think we do recognise, indeed, uh, in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister, uh, uh, ILEX is a fairly frequent topic of conversation, uh, given the uh, particular interest that the Deputy First Minister has uh, on the, the issue. Uh, I think that uh, all I can really say to him is that we will certainly be doing it as soon as possible. There is no dragging of feet or delay on the part of OFM, DFM or its officials. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. First Minister, Minister you have been reported as indicating the challenging nature and scope of the Haas talks. What is your expectation of the process and outcome by December? Well, I know there have been some people who have sought to uh, indicate that uh, I was overly negative in relation to the, the Haas talks. Uh, I think we need to remember, first of all, why Dr. Richard Haas uh, and Megan O'Sullivan are carrying out the facilitating role that they are. These are matters that uh, we have uh, within this chamber and uh, within our parties outside of this chamber spent many years discussing. Uh, it was a matter that uh, the Deputy First Minister and I got engaged in in relation to parades right back to the Hillsborough Castle uh, talks. Uh, and indeed, before that, uh, all parties in this chamber uh, discussed these matters but failed to reach any conclusions during the course of uh, previous negotiations. Uh, but over the last 18 months, two years, there have been intensive discussions uh, within uh, an all-party committee uh, that was uh, set up by the Deputy First Minister uh, and I. And while a wide range of issues were agreed, there were three matters that uh, had uh, Found, were found to be too difficult to reach agreement at that time. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I committed ourselves that uh, we would set up a working group of uh, some description uh, and attempt to continue to work at these matters and try and get them resolved. So by their very nature, these are difficult issues that thus far we have been able to resolve. Uh, and I don't want to be putting any undue pressure uh, on uh, Richard Haas and his uh, team by raising expectations. Uh, however, in our conversations uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Haas, it is fairly clear that uh, he is absolutely determined to uh, do what he can to facilitate uh, agreement. Uh, I'm glad to see that all of the parties that have entered those discussions have indicated that they are doing that in a positive uh, manner. Uh, and I can assure that as far as this party is concerned, that's the way that we will approach those discussions. Thank you, and I thank the First Minister for that uh, comprehensive uh, answer. But, uh, First Minister, some parties have indicated that if no consensus can be found in the panel that Haas uh, will bring forward his own proposals. What is your view to that approach? Well, 
I think particularly the Alliance Party and the SDLP seem to, to indicate that if it wasn't possible within the talks to reach an agreement, then Dr. Haas uh, should bring forward proposals himself. Uh, I wouldn't want to fetter in any way uh, how uh, the Haas talks should operate and what might happen in the event of failure, because I think we have to approach these talks on the, the basis of doing everything that we can to make them succeed. Uh, however, I think we all know that if we're wanting anything to stick in Northern Ireland, it's necessary for there to be agreement amongst the, the parties. And I see little advantage in Dr. Haas putting forward his view if he has been unable to get agreement for those views within the, the talks process. Though he may well find it advantageous if he sees areas uh, where there could be uh, further work carried out where he thinks it might be possible for us to, to look at in more detail uh, in an attempt to get a solution if he runs out of time. Order members, question number five has been withdrawn. Magellan McBoyne. Good. Cam Colia, can I ask the First and Deputy First Minister when they will publish the new racial uh, equality strategy? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'll ask my colleague, uh, Junior Minister John Bell, to answer that question. In terms of the uh, racial equality strategy, uh, which uh, we have put a lot of work into, um, our officials have been liaising directly with the racial equality panel. Uh, and also the wider representatives of the sector. Uh, and the purpose of that was to refocus and to refine the racial equality uh, strategy. Now, following the last meeting of the racial equality panel, the draft strategy is nearing completion. Uh, we intend to commence uh, the public consultation uh, exercise as soon as possible thereafter. August, can I thank junior, junior Minister Bell for his response? And can I further ask, when will the proposed crisis fund or emergency fund, as promised, in addition to the tiers one to three of the minority ethnic development fund, uh, be in place? Well, in the line with the recommendations uh, from an evaluation of the minority ethnic development fund, uh, we have, as the member has indicated, uh, given an agreement in principle that there should be a crisis fund element. That crisis fund element uh, will be in addition uh, to the £1.1 million pounds annual budget. Uh, the size of that crisis fund is currently uh, being examined. Uh, it's still to be decided. And it's envisaged that the crisis fund would be delivered by a third party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, First Minister, given there have been a number of media reports indicating that you have been critical of NAMA, can you give us your assessment of their performance to date? Well, I, I saw some headlines that would have suggested that uh, I was critical uh, of NAMA. Uh, in actual fact, I, I think NAMA have performed according to uh, their own guidelines, uh, just exactly as one might have uh, expected, and in relation to Northern Ireland, have been very helpful uh, in that they could, at an early stage, have uh, gone for a fire sale of assets in Northern Ireland, which would have been vastly damaging uh, to uh, the uh, construction industry, particularly uh, in Northern Ireland, but also to our, our property market. Uh, my uh, complaint uh, in relation to NAMO was not about the organisation, but about the fact that banks in Northern Ireland principally, but NAMO and also the Presbyterian Mutual Society, are all holding on to very considerable assets that could be developed and therefore bring jobs to the construction industry. Uh, the, uh, the fact that they are holding on to those assets is understandable from their point of view in that they hope to maximise the uh, amount of uh, revenue that they might receive uh, from their, their sale. Uh, however, it is considerably damaging to our ability to grow our economy and to get our economy moving again. Uh, and, and that's the point I'm making. Uh, it isn't a criticism of, of NAMA. NAMA is doing exactly what one would expect uh, with their fiduciary responsibility. 
But I think we, we do have to recognise that the banks, NAMA and the Presbyterian Mutual, Mutual Society, holding on to assets does freeze development in Northern Ireland. Thomas. Thank, thank you, and thank the First Minister for his response. But can the First Minister outline what he believes the solutions to the challenges could be? Well, I, I suppose one of the solutions is for, for instance, uh, NAMA uh, to do a little more of what they had been doing with one or two of the developments, where they actually uh, introduced some of their own funding in order to develop out a project. They did it with uh, an office block, or are doing it with an office block down in uh, Oxford Street area. Uh, they're doing it with a housing estate out in uh, Dundonald. Uh, and that allows them, obviously, to get a, a higher uh, revenue return for the, the asset, but ensures that development does take place. And I think if the banks would perhaps do more of that, uh, it would be helpful. The other option, of course, is that some uh, financial institutions or other organisations uh, come in, buy the assets off those uh, organisations, whether it's the banks, NAM or the Presbyterian Mutual Society, and build them out. Man, members, that ends the period for topical questions. We now move to our questions that appear in the order paper. And I call Dahi Mackay. Mr Mackay. Can I clear a case of Raheem, question number one? Uh, Mr Speaker, with uh, your permission, I will answer questions 1, 9 and 14 together. And I trust that, given the nature of the questions, you will allow me sufficient latitude to give the House as complete an answer as possible. The Deputy First Minister and I travelled to New York City on Monday the 9th of September to undertake a number of engagements to promote the Northern Ireland business message in advance of the economic conference which will take place on the 10th and 11th of October. We had been invited to be the keynote speakers at the Wall Street 50 Awards Dinner which honours some of the most successful financial services executives in the United States. Around that invitation, we built a program of meetings that allowed us to engage with both existing and potential investors and to meet with uh, other key individuals. We met our good friend from Citigroup, Bill Mills, the Chief Executive Officer in Northern, North America, and John Healy, Citigroup's uh, IT Senior Group Manager. Citigroup, of course, came to Northern Ireland back in 2004 with an original plan to create 375 jobs by 2009. The company now employs in excess of 1,200 people, and the Belfast facility is one of, the, of only four centres of excellence uh, in the world, and the only one that uh, City have in the United Kingdom. We also met with uh, Duncan Niederer, Chief Executive uh, Officer of the New York uh, Stock Exchange. Duncan, like Bill Mills, is a good friend of Northern Ireland and a significant supporter of our inward investment drive, and the NYSE employs some 300 people at its Belfast facility. Like Citigroup, the NYSE is a blue-chip internationally recognised company. Both companies confirmed that they would act as advocates for Northern Ireland at the October conference. We called with Mern Bloomberg at City Hall, where we discussed the investment conference and encouraged him to use his influence to seek participation by his contacts in corporate America. Mr. Speaker, we also met with uh, potential investors who, as I'm sure members will understand, I'm unable to reveal for commercially sensitive reasons. We used that time to underscore our personal interest in developing relationships with investors and assured the company's senior management teams of the executive's continuing commitment to the economic development of Northern Ireland. We were delighted to receive a behind-the-scenes tour as guests of the World Trade Centre Memorial, where we met Marcus Robinson, the Belfast-based award-winning documentary filmmaker who has produced a work on the rebuilding of the centre following the 9-11 tragedy. We had the opportunity to meet with Larry Silverstein, the New York businessman who is imaginatively developing the World Trade Centre site. Following the theme of regeneration, we visited Brooklyn Navy Yard to meet executives at the Steiner Film Studios to look at opportunities to promote collaboration and film production in Northern Ireland. Mr. Speaker, at the Wall Street Top 50 event, one of the most prestigious in the New York financial sector calendar. We addressed an audience of some 250 financial services executives, highlighting the benefits of doing business with Northern Ireland and promoting the October Investment Conference. It is worth noting that the combined employment figure for the companies represented in that room exceeded 300,000. 
In summary, Mr. Speaker, the visit allowed us to extend an invitation to the Economic Conference to a wide range of business executives. Furthermore, it provided an opportunity to strengthen relationships with existing investors and to begin relationships with new ones. It is our intention to continue to build on the good work that Invest Northern Ireland is doing in the U.S. when we visit Boston and Chicago next month. Plans are also at an advanced stage for our visit to Japan before the end of the year at the invitation of the Japanese Prime Minister, whom we met during the G8 summit. Mr. Mackay. Mr. Mackay. Can, can I thank the, the First Minister for his comprehensive answer? I think what he does outline is the great success that we have had in terms of OFM, DFM's work uh, with New York uh, as a city. Now, that was only possible because of the, uh, the saving uh, of the, route, the air passenger route to New York, uh, and that shows what success uh, can, can gather from, the, from, from successful air passenger duty policy. Can I ask the First Minister, is it not time uh, that we dealt with the issue of air passenger duty uh, in its entirety? so that we can have more success stories like New York uh, throughout Europe as well as America uh, and ensure that we actually boost uh, our tourism sector uh, and also lo our local airports. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, of course the issue of air passenger duty in my view would not have been addressed if it had not been for the, the visit the Deputy First Minister and I had uh, with the uh, Chief Executive of uh, United. Uh, during that uh, visit it became very clear what the intention of United was uh, had that uh, matter not been dealt with. Uh, happily, I have to say that the then Secretary of State and the Chancellor acted promptly uh, and uh, at our behest uh, gave us a dispensation. Of course, if any further dispensation is to be given, I hope it would be UK-wide so that we would not have to carry the, the cost of it. But I do know that there are voices being raised right across the United Kingdom uh, urging the, the Chancellor to look at this uh, issue because of the additional hardship that it creates. Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think, given the answer the Minister gave to the first question in relation to the trip, um, underpins the importance of actually the trips to uh, New York and, and other places such as that. But can the Minister indicate to the House, maybe from some of his most recent trips, what foreign direct investment will come to Northern Ireland? Well, we have been enormously successful in the past, and uh, I pay credit, of course, to Invest Northern Ireland and the Deputy Minister, uh, Arlene Foster, who, of course, has just returned from South Africa, where I believe that uh, she had a very good hearing with a number of companies uh, there. Uh, and it's quite clear if you're not out there uh, fishing, you're not going to catch anything. Uh, and uh, to use a, the Deputy First Minister's terms. Uh, and of course, Northern Ireland has been going out much more than ever before and has gained the reward for it. And indeed, that was uh, recognised by the uh, economists. It was recognised in other statistics which showed that uh, Northern Ireland is doing better than any other part of the United Kingdom in relation to the size of its population as far as uh, foreign direct investment is concerned. It is recognised in terms of us being able to bring uh, more foreign direct investment into Northern Ireland at any time in the history of Northern Ireland. It shows the value of devolution. We are under devolution being able to bring in more investment into Northern Ireland than those who are acting as our proxies under direct rule. The other thing I would say to the, the, the member, it isn't just a case of going out to find new investors, though we were out speaking to, to new investors and potential investors on this occasion. But during the course of those, we build up the relationship that we have, the companies that are, that are here. And we met with several companies who are already based in Northern Ireland. We talked to, to them about their plans for the future to see what role we might play in that. Uh, and it's interesting, I'll not mention the company, but even in one company that we were talking to during the course of that conversation, we touched on a, a subject that they hadn't been aware of our expertise in it, and discussions have started up uh, on the, the potential for, for us being a, a base for the, that company's uh, work in that particular area. So it's important that you have the network, that you build up the contacts, that you have friends in those businesses, uh, and they have uh, an access at the highest possible level. Uh, so that if there are issues that they need to have addressed, they know where to go to get it done. Sidney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the First Minister for his responses so far? And uh, can I continue on the theme of trying to attract as many jobs to Northern Ireland as we possibly can? But uh, can I ask the First Minister, to what extent does he feel that the, Nor the New York trip and visit uh, will have and will impact and help in next month's uh, investment conference in Belfast? in the promotion of Northern Ireland 
as a good place to invest and to grow business? Well, we got commitments, uh, Mr. Speaker, from certain people who will be coming, uh, if you like, to give a testimony uh, during the course of the investment conference, because we found it hugely successful on previous occasions uh, not to be making the argument ourselves, but uh, it is far more appealing to a potential investor to hear what those who have already invested have found. And when you have companies, for instance, uh, I think a good example is Allstate, who started with a small number, have built it up now to over several thousand in Northern Ireland, who have reinvested over half a dozen times. So uh, if you have 70 per cent of the companies that invest in Northern Ireland reinvesting in Northern Ireland, I think that gives a very clear uh, indicator to people that this is a place to come to, that there is a good message here, that we, we have a competitive regime in terms of uh, costs, both in terms of uh, property costs and in terms of labour costs, but also that we have a skilled workforce and a loyal workforce that means that uh, they have people who are going to stick with them for a long period of time and that uh, churn rate is such that it uh, is very considerable savings to their overall bottom line. John Dallet. Yes, sir. Can I thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, did the ministers have an opportunity to minimise the impact of the summer disturbances on potential inward investors who might come here? Well, I, I think uh, any unrest is clearly in the, the, the backcloth of Northern Ireland is very unhelpful uh, in terms of bringing uh, investment. I have to say that maybe it's because we set out in those discussions to uh, indicate our view on, on matters before people ask questions, but it was never raised with us, but that's probably because uh, we, uh, we caught the ball before it bounced, uh, and we indicate that uh, there is massive stability in Northern Ireland uh, compared with many countries and towns and cities uh, around North America. Uh, if you were to uh, compare the crime rate in Northern Ireland with the crime rate uh, in uh, major U.S. cities, Northern Ireland comes out of it uh, very well. Uh, it is the, the nature of the kind of violence and unrest that we have that gives it the, the news headlines. But clearly, uh, any unrest, any violence, any rioting, any killing, any injury is unhelpful to the message that uh, uh, Arlene Foster and the Deputy First Minister and I have to, to uh, pass to, to potential investors. Sandra Overend. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister um, for all that information. Maybe could the, the First Minister outline really how much interest there is in the economic conference here uh, in Northern Ireland and any targets he might have for that conference? I think it will be a very successful uh, economic uh, conference. Uh, of course, the success of economic conferences, I suppose, is uh, on what the outcomes are, and the outcomes aren't always known uh, on the day of a conference or the days of a conference, but uh, sometime uh, afterwards. Uh, but in terms of participation and interest, uh, there is very considerable interest, and there are many indications of willingness to take part in the various sessions of the, the conference and of people who are going to attend. Of course, it arises out of a very successful G8 conference uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and we have asked the, uh, the embassies of each of those countries uh, to give us uh, assistance. And I have to say that we have been very well helped uh, uh, through, uh, obviously, Detty and Invest Northern Ireland with the, the Trade and Industry Department in the United Kingdom as a, a whole uh, and through their, their embassies. So there is a, a joint enterprise, because, as you know, the, the Prime Minister uh, is going to uh, be directly involved uh, in the, the conference, uh, and I think that adds to its prestige and its importance and its attractiveness to people to come. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for his progress report on, his, on their recent uh, trip. But would the First Minister uh, not recognise that it's quite unsustainable uh, to be keep uh, presenting a united front when abroad, but to be presiding over a um, divisions and disunity when at home here in Northern Ireland? Well, uh, we're part of a, a five-party mandatory coalition, and I, I think we do need to be a little more mature about uh, issues. We're not around uh, this chamber going to be agreeing on every issue. There are going to be differences. What is important is that we manage those uh, differences. Uh, and that we recognise that uh, that can only be done on the basis of uh, respect for each other's position. Uh, of course, it would be nice 
if we could agree on every single issue uh, and that that could be done promptly. That is not the, the case. But it is important that uh, when we go out to market Northern Ireland to the wider world that we are singing from the same hymn sheet. And that isn't hard because we both believe exactly the same thing in terms of wanting to, to grow our economy, to encourage people to come, to provide jobs, uh, to ensure that our economy grows uh, in Northern Ireland. So there is no re reluctance on the part of the Deputy First Minister or myself where we have common ground to exploit it to the full. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. The uh, process of designing the United Community Youth Programme is being taken forward by a design group specifically established to research and detail proposals and costs for implementation. This will include how the programme will be rolled out. Officials from the design group have already been engaging with stakeholders and that process will be increasing over the coming weeks. I am pleased to say that the proposal has been widely welcomed and there is significant interest and excitement in the potential of this project. The design group has already undertaken considerable work and is expected to conclude in the next few months. The report will inform ministerial decisions on the way forward. Speaker, bearing in mind around 46,000 young people are without employment and you're offering 10,000 places, can the, uh, Mr Robinson indicate what the process, the decision-making process is with the criteria for awarding those places and can he also confirm that his office will be taking the lead in this matter? Thank you. Well, Mr Speaker, first of all, it was because of our recognition that uh, there were uh, very considerable numbers. He indicates 46,000. That's a, a moving feast, as he will understand, uh, that we decided this was an appropriate uh, programme. Uh, indeed, it is why we specifically indicated that the places should go to those in the needs category. I have to say, not everybody is as convinced as he and I might be uh, that there will be the, uh, the number of people wanting to take part from that particular category. And indeed, some of the discussion is, uh, if not all of the places are taken up by the needs category, uh, whether there should indeed uh, be a uh, further revision as to who is entitled to take part in the, the programme. Uh, the Department obviously has the overarching uh, responsibility, uh, but we are, not, we're not, we are not a delivery department uh, to that extent, and therefore we will look to other departments who are more directly involved, who would ha have staff uh, uh, available uh, in order to, to look after the, the implementation. Uh, of course, the programme has three particular elements. Uh, one, of course, which is directly involved with the opportunity of young people to get jobs in the future, and that is a, a placement uh, with a, a business enterprise so that they might uh, become accustomed to getting up in the morning, going out to a place of work, seeing how uh, business uh, operates. The second is more of a civic function where they would uh, get uh, involved with uh, some uh, charitable or community or other organisation. Uh, so that they are uh, becoming better citizens. And the third element is that cross-community element, uh, where unfortunately many young people do not have the degree of interaction with people from a different community background. Uh, the programme will allow them to, to do that so that they have a better understanding of other people that they share uh, this uh, piece of territory with. Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I say that uh, this has been a uh, a massively popular proposal, and can the First Minister uh, outline the positive impacts that this programme or a programme of this nature and scale uh, could potentially have uh, overall? Well, I'm grateful to the, the member for his, uh, his view of uh, the positive nature of the, the programme. Uh, I have to say to him that uh, as this is a new project and it is a, a very ambitious number. It may well be the case that we will end up with a, a choice of uh, a longer lead-in period if we are going immediately to go for 10,000 places or a shorter lead-in period if we want to scale it up uh, and uh, phase it in. Uh, whichever is the, the case, I am pretty sure that it will be beneficial. It is beneficial in terms of young people having the opportunity to get uh, engaged and involved in work. Uh, it will make them better rounded human beings, uh, just as the, the uh, Peace Corps, for instance, in the United States 
uh, is something that an employer looks at as a positive element in anybody's CV. I think if they see somebody who has gone through this programme, they will recognise that they are more rounded individuals. Uh, and of course, from a cross-community good relations point of view, the fact that they have gone through a programme uh, in relation to uh, the, the good relations uh, aspect uh, of our work, I think is beneficial to the community as a whole. Colin Eastwood. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I can thank the First Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask him, though, for some more detail as to some of the major companies that are, uh, will be supporting this programme? Well, I, I can't give him those, those kind of details. Obviously, the design group will, will bring us forward a report on that. What I can say to him is that, as I have gone out and about since the programme was announced, I've talken, I talked to people who are leaders of various uh, organisations, uh, for instance, the uh, CBI, where they have indicated that they will positively support it and they will encourage people to, uh, in their organisation to, to support it. I've talked to people in community organisations who are very interested in the opportunity that they will have, both of getting people interested in the work that they are doing uh, and, of course, getting some help for the work that uh, they are doing as well. Uh, and, of course, in the good relations, I think it is self-evident how that uh, would be helpful. Uh, but un until the design team come back with uh, proposals, I can't give him any further details on that matter. But, of course, when it's available, I will. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question three, please. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Since devolution, we have tripled the funding available for victims and survivor services and needs. In addition, we have also undertaken a significant fundamental reform of provision and support for the sector, which has now been completed. This has included agreeing a 10-year strategy, establishing the Victims Commission, the subsequent creation of a Victims Forum, the commissioning and obtaining the new Comprehensive Needs Assessment from the Commission and the establishment of a new streamlined delivery mechanism in the victim service. The new programme in place through the service includes <coughs> health and well-being, social support and individual needs. These cover a wide range of the key activities such as help with chronic pain, disability support and also, of course, education. Individuals will have a package of assistance tailored to their own particular assessed need. Additionally, the service is currently reviewing funding allocations with officials and the Commission for Victims and Survivors based on information from recent needs, based assessments and from the monitoring returns. This re review will ensure that the service moves forward to the second year of its programme with the appropriate funding allocations based on actual assessed needs of victims and survivors. Through the service, we are absolutely dedicated to ensuring that victims and survivors get the best help that we can provide. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Junior Minister for his answer. Can the Junior Minister outline if support for groups has also been increased, or does this represent an increase to individual victims only? I'm pleased to say to the Honourable Member that it is both support for individual members but also the support for the groups that has been increased. I said at the start that uh, our focus was on ensuring that we had a tailor-made service that directly met the needs of individual victims, and many of these needs differ. Uh, certainly on an individual basis, many people want an individual service, but we also know that the groups, the groups themselves, the victims' groups have provided excellent work, really good practice, and have helped and supported victims. Therefore, I would like to take a moment just to pay tribute to those who have worked collectively in a group format with victims, because in many cases it has been the allocation of that group format that has allowed a level of, of community support, allowed people to meet together with people who have experienced uh, similar circumstances, difficulties, similar trauma, to share their experiences in a group setting and to provide a group support uh, for those individual people that has led them uh, to lead better and more productive lives and to deal with the trauma that they should never have had to endure in the first place. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the junior minister to account for the delays and difficulties experienced by some victims in applying for assistance from the Victims and Survivors Service? Well, I think that I mean, it's a difficult premise that the member comes from, and I find it hard when we have actually tripled the amount of funding that has gone into the sector to try to find something negative, but that may be the case. I think what we wanted to do, uh, and it may be the case in his mind, I think what we wanted to do was to ensure that we had a service that was responsive, that could look to the needs of individuals who wanted to meet and be assessed comprehensively uh, in an individual setting. And we also wanted to look together at the support uh, that groups um, have received. I think anybody that looks uh, fairly at uh, what the programme has done and its, its, its three strands uh, in the past, what it is going to do uh, into the future, will look at a victim support programme that particularly around health and wellbeing, to which £8.5 million pounds has been allocated directly to contribute to the health and the social care of victims and survivors through individual courses of treatment and or care. Take the social support programme to which £7.3 million pounds has been allocated, aiming to support and maintain the resilience of our victims and survivors to assist in addressing the legacy of their past and to assist in building a better and a shared future. And I should also say to the member that the service has also been allocated with £3.6 million to provide direct financial assistance to those who have identified needs. 300,000 was also allocated to research and capacity building to ensure that the service that is being provided is the best possible one to people who need it most. Alec Atwood. Mr. Atwood. Speaker, uh, I know that the, deputy, or the junior minister will accept that in addition to resources, there are many families, survivors and victims who still seek truth and accountability. Would the junior minister confirm whether he is in favour, in addition to the due process and criminal investigation, if he is in favour of truth and accountability mechanisms that sees those in command and control of state organisations and paramilitary uh, organisations, that they, those in command and control, should be held to account for their actions? Well, of course, I am in favour uh, of bringing justice to innocent victims. <coughs> and victims deserve justice, and they have been failed in many cases by, just, uh, by the justice system. Because 60 per cent of all the death and murder was attributed to Republican terrorists, 30 per cent to loyalist terrorists, and only 10 per cent, which is the matter uh, that the member seems to focus on to a certain extent in his question, is in deaths relating to the state. I think we should deal with the 90 per cent of those who caused the difficulties. We need to find out where the terrorists kept their records of who their command and control structure was. We need to find out who the terrorist organisations were who directed and sent out people to innocently find themselves in a situation where they were murdered. The 90 per cent need to be held to account, as well as where there is evidence to bring to account anyone uh, within the state who is responsible for death. But the Sutton Index is clear. 60 per cent of death were carried out by Republican murderers, 30 per cent by loyalist terrorists, and only 10 per cent by the state. So I think it's time for the terrorists and their organisations to step up to the plate to tell us the truth of what they do know. I have to say I don't have a lot of confidence, and that's because the jury I was never in the IRA Adams doesn't inspire me. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. For Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the focus of our visit to the United States earlier this month was economic development. We had the opportunity to meet with a wide range of business executives, and we used those meetings to promote inward investment and to encourage participation in the October Investment Conference. Senior American government officials are based in Washington, D.C. We were in New York, so we neither sought nor did we have the opportunity to raise any issues with them. John Rogers. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, Considering that the, the, the immigration bill is coming to the House of Representatives very soon, is there any plans to go to Capitol Hill 
to lobby on behalf of the undocumented who come from all parts of our community. I always enjoy people who uh, use the, the, the English language uh, to uh, mix, gentrify, if you like, uh, something that uh, might be considered different. Uh, of course, we are talking about illegal immigrants rather than the undocumented Irish. Uh, and I don't think it is a, a job for, for me uh, to make uh, representations. It would obviously be a matter for the Irish government to deal with Irish passport holders, uh, nor indeed do I think it would be right for me uh, to uh, persuade the uh, Congress or Senate of the United States on these matters. It is, after all, a matter for the United States as to who they allow to enter the United States or who they allow to stay in the United States, though I have no doubt that many of those who he described as undocumented uh, are people who have made a contribution over many years in the U United States, uh, and no doubt if the, uh, the politicians are, are looking uh, at uh, categories, they may well find favour with those who have made a contribution in the United States simply rather than those who are in the United States to see what they can get out of the United States. Order members, that includes questions to the Office of First Minister and Deputy.